All right, species dis uh, diversity, what can influence this? Um, there was a notion uh, a while back, uh, early part of the 20th century, by a really well-known ecologist named Clements. Um, he spoke of what he t called the climax community. That is, through time, a community would develop and sort of reach its end point. Um, and it was a mature community at that point, And it really didn't change much after that. Um, however, um, other ecologists began to question whether this is really the case or how often you actually see a, quote, climax community. Um, and it's been thought that really communities are sort of in a constant state of flux and change due to things that are impacting them. And that is there is typically enough disturbance of the system that causes change in that system. That, that system really don't just reach some point of stasis or complete equilibrium and non-change. Um, and so indeed, disturbance can play a significant role in modifying systems. Fire is a really good example. Um, so fire can come through and, and burn up an area and then basically sort of set it back to some original state, some simple state, that then it can begin to develop again. Um, so um, this has led to this idea that there's sort of um, some level of disturbance that creates a maximum level of diversity. Um, and that is, if you have too little disturbance, you can just sort of end up with this relatively uniform habitat that's the same throughout, whereas when you get disturbance, you end up with sort of a patchwork of habitats that are different uh, stages of development. Um, and so this study from New Zealand about streams demonstrates this, and that when you get sort of a low level of disturbance, you have relatively low diversity. When you get a too high level of disturbance, you also have lower diversity. But at some intermediate level, you tend to get the most diversity. Again, at too low, the, the system kind of develops into this relatively uniform system. And too much disturbance sort of keeps it in, from ever reaching sort of a later stage. Um, in 1988, they had a large fire in Yellowstone that burned up a good chunk of the large portion of the national park. Um, and so immediately after, people thought, oh, this is awful. Look, this landscape is just destroyed. But it's actually a habitat that's used to having fire, and it wasn't too long before other species started coming in, and then you would have had tree seedlings begin to grow and, and it wouldn't take too many years before you get a relatively diverse system divide, developing after this disturbance. And so that leads to this idea of what we call ecological succession. And that is when you have a change, a disturbance to the system, like a fire, it sort of sets the stage for a succession of species. Okay. Um, and this is thought of in two ways, what's called primary and secondary. And primary is when the system is really set back to just sort of, not even soil, they're just sort of bare rock. Whereas secondary succession is the, the system kind of goes back to where there's soil, but there's been a significant disturbance. So a forest fire would be a good example of secondary succession. The soil is there, it's still intact, it's just that the vegetation has been removed. Um, <clears throat> so this is sometimes where we see an example of facilitation that early arriving species those first few plants arrive can create conditions that facilitate the arrival and success of later species um, good example of primary succession is retreating glaciers that is as glaciers retreat as they melt they basically leave behind bare rock there's no soil there and so you get, it's colonized by these very simple types of plants, uh, literally you know, some types of protus algaes and uh, mosses and, and uh, things like that. And so you have to start from ground zero and start to slowly break those rocks apart and get the first kinds of flowering 
plants in there and then um, some small shrubs and then finally much later you can get the forest and so you can see Glacier Bay in Alaska is a good example of this primary succession because in the late in the mid 1700s the glacier extended all the way down to this part of the bay but the glacier has been retreating and so the more recently retreated areas are still in a really early state of development because it takes a while to slowly break those rock stars down and start to form a soil and so even stuff that's been in succession over 100 years is still in this state but by the time you get to um, you know 150 years and then a couple hundred years you can see you start to get a mature forest developing there but it, it takes a while with primary succession um, So the changes that occur, the, the, the first plants, uh, mosses and things that come in can slowly change the, like I said, the soil, uh, create soil in the first place and change the soil such that those early pioneer species, those first ones basically again facilitate the arrival of later ones. And so the nitrogen levels in the soil are slowly increasing as the successional stages proceed one to the other. Um, people are a significant uh, force on the planet, a significant source of disturbance. Um, and our disturbances tend to reduce species diversity. And of course, an e example is, say, agriculture. You take a natural habitat and turn it into an agricultural system, and you take a habitat that maybe had tens to hundreds of species, and now you have corn there. Um, Fishing is a good example of this. Uh, there's this trawling that occurs where you basically sort of run nets along the bottom of the sea and kind of scoop everything up. And uh, as you can see in these pictures, that can have a significantly negative impact on diversity. Um, now, other things that can affect diversity on a global scale. Um, we see differences across the globe in terms of diversity, and latitude is one of them in that we tend to see greater species richness, greater species diversity at the tropics compared to um, latitudes north and south of the equator, north and south of the tropics. Um, and it's thought that um, there's a couple reasons for this. Climate, for example, can be playing a role. The tropics um, don't freeze, they have, they're warm year-round, they have a continuous growing season, and so they basically, instead of, like around here where things kind of shut down in the wintertime, they just have biological activity all the time, and so uh, evolution can proceed in a more time, quick manner down there um, than up here. And um, so uh, one way to look at this is um, evapotranspiration because that's the uh, water that's lost um, from the plants and so on an annual basis there's going to be more evaporation evapotranspiration occurring down in the tropics than in temperate areas and this is a general trend you see when you get more evapotranspiration on a yearly basis you tend to see greater diversity both of the plants and of if you go out to, say, Percy Warner Park, for example, here in Nashville, you might see mm, maybe 20, maybe 30 species of trees at most out there. If you go to the same size chunk of land in a tropical forest down in Central or South America, you'll see hundreds of species of trees. There's just incredible diversity down there. Um, area. The size of an area affects diversity. and um, probably is not too surprising that when you have a larger area you tend to have more diversity. Smaller plots of land have smaller diversity. Um, and this leads into what is called island equilibrium model or this what's called island biogeography. This studies that have been done extensively looking at islands and the diversity on them. And um, what you see is that an island will have sort of an equilibrium species diversity that's a function of immigration to the island and extinction of species on the island okay and when we compare smaller islands and larger islands in theory 
larger islands should have more species because they have more immigration and lower extinction and vice versa on smaller islands and when you have islands that are farther away from the mainland they should have fewer species than ones that are nearer to the mainland um, and this is a trend that is definitely seen when you go to different island areas like the Galapagos and that is in the Galapagos the islands are various sizes and the bigger islands have more species than the smaller islands um, now this is not just some thing that applies to islands but it's also quite useful when it comes to looking at say um, national parks and things like that when you're establishing areas to try to maintain species diversity if you have relatively small national parks you're going to have relatively low diversity but if you have large contiguous areas of land that are national parks something like on the scale of a yellowstone which is quite large then you can have relatively high species diversity you'll be able to save preserve conserve more species um, pathogens have a big effect on uh, systems um, and can alter the structure of those systems um, a good example of that around here is that the um, American chestnut used to be a tree that was quite common in the forest around here but now you don't see it at all because a pathogen was introduced from Asia this fungal blight that basically wiped out the tree and so that pathogen had a significant impact on that system um, coral reefs are seeing some of the same effects as well um, and people are quite good at transporting these pathogens around the globe that's how the fungal blight got here um, so um, we're seeing this as well in human diseases um, what are called these zoonotic pathogens these pathogens that arise or begin or they, they originate in a wild animal but they get transferred to humans um, it's thought that this is how HIV came about it originated in primates in Africa but then has moved into the human population and spread around the globe um, so um, when this happens um, it's always useful to find out where it's originating from um, Ebola is an example of this that they think originates from fruit bats in Central Africa and when people eat the fruit bats they can get the Ebola and then they can give it to each other um, and so of course when you can identify the vector the thing that is carrying the pathogen and is transferring it to humans you can have, perhaps get a better control of that um, pathogen Lyme disease for example is found in the United States and it's thought that um, these shrews are the primary host for the pathogen and so if that's the case you would want to uh, avoid contact with these shrews avian flu is one you hear about around here as well that's transferred from migrating birds you can get passed on to humans and horses I believe as well um, so studying this is of significance um, all right last thing for this chapter a long chapter again here's the uh, nice table to look at in terms of these species interactions um, and uh, their nature so this would be a good thing to to study okay that's it for chapter 54